Hello again to my next Life with Ella's Dan Loss video. I want to talk about medication um, right now and sort of other things that I use. Uh, may not qualify as medication, I guess, supplements, uh, other items that I need on a regular basis. I'm obviously not advocating any particular brand really here. I'm going to talk about a lot of different things. Um, I'm going to show you what I need for an average month. There are other things I use on top of this. There are some things that I've opted not to include in this discussion because there are some medications that I don't like and I'm actually scared of taking to be honest. So there are some drugs um, that are very far up the scale that I'm holding back on. Um, they're not something I take regularly enough to consider part of my routine so what I'm going to show you is really very typical things I do use above and beyond this however so it's quite a haul now apologies in advance if any rats come scurrying past there are a couple of them free ranging on my bed which seemed the obvious place to show the drugs so here we are um, I take them for lots of different things I mean not all of it is pain there are other things in the mixture so I guess I'll start off with uh, with my general daily routine so this stuff um, is oxycodone which is a strong opioid um, three to five times stronger than morphine effectively this is my everyday drug uh, it's nasty stuff really it's incredibly addictive I, I use two strengths together to give me the dose that I need, and these last 12 hours, uh, they come in two sorts, Long Tech is the brand name of the long release, it takes 12 hours. Um, this is one of the, to be honest, this is one of the cheapest preparations that are out there, and I really as a patient fully advocate GPs using the cheapest brand possible, as long as it still works, to save the practice money, which ultimately means that there is money available for patients who need it. I was taking a branded um, preparation that admittedly had another drug mixed with it. I was taking something called Targinact, which is oxycodone hydrochloride mixed with naloxone, which almost counteracts this in the gut and is supposed to prevent the gut side effects of oxycodone. After four years, I could say categorically it doesn't. So I've changed over to just using it without that. And if I'd gone for a different brand of this, I think the tariff to the GP difference was something like they were saving 20 or 30 quid a month by getting rid of the naloxone. By moving to this, they're saving nearly £60 a month on this medication alone. So I see that as worthwhile. I don't see the need to kind of get my money's worth and take that attitude. I go with what helps my GP, really. So, long tech. That's twice a day. That is my main baseline pain relief. I take with it pregabalin um, which comes from Pfizer it comes in lots of doses um, 300 mg capsules of these ones which are big and red and white we have two of those a day this was originally I believe an epilepsy drug it um, does lots of different things it's used these days for generalized anxiety disorder and different types of pain what I principally take it for is the neurological pain and neuropathic pain caused by constant entrapments of my nerves because my joints are moving around all the time and crushing the nerves. So this stuff um, basically dulls the nerve signals, you could say, and that means I get less neurological or neurogenic pain, and that is what this is for. So two of those a day at 300 milligrams do me... Um, the world of good and I've been using this for um, about five years now uh, worth saying the oxycodone that I'm using again I've been using it for over four years I've just had a tiny dose increase after nearly four years of use so the addiction kind of worry that a lot of people get around using it to be honest if you use it in the right way in a slow release preparation and you're really really strict about it oxycodone doesn't have to be as terrifying as people think I think a lot of medics are more terrified of it than patients, but I've been very fortunate. I've had my last three GPs, I've had a really sensible approach to pain control and have done really what has been the right thing for me. So, next drug, uh, back actually to oxycodone. This is a liquid preparation um, which comes in a bottle. 
and it has a syringe for dosing it. It's dyed by orange and this stuff I use morning, night and for any breakthrough pain really during the day. It releases within 5 to 10 minutes so this is a really good way to get the drug into your system if you've got really really bad pain from a major dislocation or in my case the getting out of bed pain and the getting into bed pains the change from horizontal to vertical for me is really excruciating so I use this to to um, to deal with that pain one of my other all day every days is paracetamol the reason I use paracetamol is A, it's a mild painkiller itself, but if you mix it with an opioid like oxycodone, it actually improves the activity of the opioid, which is really cool. So it gives me a kind of effective higher dose in some ways. Now, I don't use it in the normal way. I use paracetamol suppositories. Yes, I shove it up my ass. Why do I do that? Faster acting, for a start. Secondly, I was using paracetamol syrup, uh, like Calpol kind of stuff. The problem with that was I can't take liquids at night because of the problems I have at the moment with my stomach releasing its contents into my lungs. Um, that was causing problems, so I went to using suppositories because obviously other end of the tract, it won't cause me issues. It has advantages of fast use. Um, I can use it when travelling easy, I don't need water to take it. Sure, I need to be able to get to a bathroom, uh, somewhere I can wash my hands. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but to be honest, when you're in really serious pain, having to shove a suppository up your ass is really your least concern. Now these are pretty small, these are... Um, you know, one of these is equivalent to one paracetamol tablet, and they are not enormous. Um, I don't think anyone would have issue with these things. I mean, they're tiny. They're really narrow. You just wet the tip, and yeah, off you go. They can be a really useful thing um, compared to using it in liquid format, and the tablets are just too slow-acting. They take too long to release in my body, which is why I use either liquid or these things these things being really a um, solution to a lot of problems. Still on painkillers, um, I'm covering up the label because it's got my personal details on it. This is ibuprofen lysine, which is um, Neurofen Express, to those of you who bought it before. 684 milligrams here is equivalent to 400 milligrams of normal ibuprofen. So um, what I'm taking really is max dose ibuprofen twice a day in the form of ibuprofen lysine. Why do I take ibuprofen lysine? I find it gentler on my easy to irritate stomach. It's also faster acting and I find it far more effective. These are pretty big tablets. These are yeah, these are pretty big beasts. And it's one of those before bed and one of those when I get up in the morning. So they last about four or five hours. Just enough to help me. These are anti-inflammatories. So to explain what they do compared to paracetamol and oxycodone. Oxycodone is pain relief, paracetamol assists that pain relief. These guys are anti-inflammatories, so they take down the inflammation and the bruising after dislocations really, and they also obviously help with the pain in the process. So that is why I use those. Those are a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, an NSAID. That really is it in terms of my main pain relief now. This is mefocarbamol. Um, which is a rubbish um, muscle relaxant. It's the kind of muscle relaxant that is hardly used anymore as it's not really very effective, which is great for me because when I need to reduce muscle spasms, what I don't want is something so strong that it will make my joints even more lax and make them dislocate. So this stuff, absolutely brilliant. Um, I take a couple of these in the morning and that is often enough. I can't take them in the evenings because they cause me digestive issues. I don't take them every day, I only use them when I've got major muscle spasms. So these to me are like diazepam to most people with muscle spasms or pain. Uh, side effects really make me quite zombie-ish and they turn your piss black, which causes hilarity at urinals. And uh, yeah, only really bad side effects I've ever had with these to be honest. Over to my lungs, which are not in the best of shape. I use fairly standard combination that every asthmatic out there uses really um, salbutamol 
Ventolin. I've tried Salmeterol, but it gave me heart palpitations. So Ventolin back to Salbutanol. That's what I use morning and night. And I use what is now called Qvar. It used to be Becatide in my day, which is a Beclomethasone dipropionate. It's an inhaled steroid, so this keeps the inflammation in the lungs down. And I use both of these at maximal dose, morning and night. I take this one through a spacer so I don't get oral thrush and this one I take normally. So they are for asthma, which I think a lot of people with EDS get. It's a real problem in EDS, because if you have a kind of coughing fit or anything, you dislocate your ribs from your breastbone, so it's really important that you keep your lungs under control, especially if you get any kind of chest infection and so on. I have a tablet that I take um, for my asthma as well, really, and in general terms. This is Montelukast. This is a mast cell stabiliser. Uh, the Monty I know comes from uh, Montreal in Canada, which is where it was first um, created. This stuff is brilliant. It's a mast cell stabiliser, as I said. It kind of replaces the old sodium chr chromoglycate, the drug that a lot of us used to use, the yellow eye drops for hay fever back in the day. This stuff uh, stabilises mast cells in the body, prevents histamine release, prevents allergic response, essentially. If you have a reactive asthma like mine, this stuff really, really helps. I've been breathing so much better since I've been using it, and it means when I do get an attack, it's so much more mild. It's also helped me in general terms. It's been found, and, and Dr. Diana, who is on Twitter, who is brilliant um, at this kind of area of mast cells and, and Ehlers-Danlos, it has been found that mast cells degranulate really easily in Ehlers-Danlos, so I think stabilising them with this stuff has worked really well. I know a lot of people with EDS use things like the low histamine diet and so on to kind of handle it. For me, this is working well enough. Uh, my post-orthostatic tachycardia, so that's where, because our, our, we don't have the muscle tone around our, our veins essentially, if I go from sitting on my haunches to standing up really quickly, most people get a little bit of a kind of head rush feeling, faint feeling. We get tachycardia, so our heart rate really changes and our blood pressure can really change in response and we can pass out. We can also just feel like general shit. So we end up having to like eat a lot of salty food, use um, electrolyte tablets and so on, and that's kind of how we cope. Uh, Montelukast for me has helped POTS, post-orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, a fair bit. So um, probably worth a try um, if um, you have histamine issues in Ellis Danvers. Uh, now I want to move over to the joys of my digestive tract. Oh, actually, I've got one more, one more pain drug, really. Um, this is capsaicin ointment. This is um, chili extract. This is something you do not handle without gloves. This is really, really nasty. Even at the really, really low strength that it's at, 0.025% weight to weight, this is vicious. I was prescribed this a couple of years ago by... Um, a consultant that I'm actually going to go as far as to call an idiot because they didn't bother to read my notes and decided I had fibromyalgia, which I categorically do not have. Uh, it's been proven that I do not have it. Uh, they were basically just treating everyone who walked into the pain clinic in the same way, that you're all either a drug seeker or you've got fibromyalgia, which in their mind clearly seemed made up. This... Um, confuses nerve signals. So the idea is you apply this to an area for about three weeks, after which the nerves kind of get a bit overloaded and they calm down. So if you've got an area of bad neurological pain or repetitive um, shallow dislocations, this stuff actually can be pretty useful, um, I have to say. So I have used it. I wouldn't say it's something I use often, but it is uh, a pretty useful drug. What I am using instead these days is these things, which is the Sartis, which is 5% lignocaine gel in a plaster. And I think I've, I've shown these a little bit in one of my other videos. But basically they're a plaster about this big with a gel on the back that pushes the local anaesthetic through the skin. Great for wrists, tops of your feet, kneecaps fingers, all those really shallow dislocations where if you can numb the shallow tissue it really does have a beneficial effect. That is now the most sort of end of my pain drugs. I'm now onto the digestive tract. I'm going to start at the top and I'm going to work down. I get through a lot of this stuff. This is knockoff Gaviscon. I swig this every night. I end up swigging it in the night when I um, am woken by not just heartburn but the contents of my stomach refluxing and aspirating into my lungs. So this has got bicarbonate, 
it has got alginate and calcium carbonate and the idea is it forms a gooey raft on top of your stomach contents to kind of stop it bubbling over into your lungs. I use uh, medication to stop that as well, motilium, which I use after every meal. This uh, makes my stomach empty. My stomach doesn't empty because of something called gastroparesis, which is in turn caused by something called visceroptosis, which is where all of your squishy bits from your stomach downwards all kind of tilt forwards and hang into your pelvis. Everything delayed. Everything takes longer to empty. So this stuff, this really helps. It empties things. It's domperidone. It does cause heart problems. I have to be really careful. I have problems with my mitral valve. So I have to be really careful how much of this I use. But yeah, it works. That and knockoff Gabascon. Moving through the system, at the other end, I get problems. So that's where this stuff comes in, Movicol. This is an effective relief from constipation. This is something you get on prescription only. It is something that you can take for normal constipation and this wonderful phenomenon, fecal impaction. If you've not had that, believe me, you don't want it. I've had it twice. It is the most undignified and unpleasant experience of my life, to be really frank. These are sachets of what is known as a macrogol, which is actually polyethylene glycol to any scientists out there. It's polyethylene glycol 3350. This is basically a gooey stuff that doesn't dissolve very well. So once you've got it into water, it will want to attract more water. You swallow it, it gets into the gut and it will draw liquid out of the blood into the gut and basically help liquefy and soften everything and keep transit going. So. I get through a couple of boxes of that when I have a really rough patch. Um, not quite so much anymore, but there were times when I was getting through far more. What I also use are these awful things. These are Microlax enemas. These are great when you're travelling again because they just solve the problem. Not really very nice. They're like a mini toothpaste tube with a long nozzle. I think you could probably work out what that's for. And basically you squirt the entire contents of this into the rectum and you wait about half an hour lying on your stomach and then, yeah, it works. Sorts out a lot of the issues of poor digestive transit in EDS, which is one of the reasons a lot of medications take longer to work for us or don't work at all. I've also used things like cyclozine, which is a hay fever drug, I guess, that is really good for sort of motion sickness, travel sickness. That's good if you can't keep medication down because you have a vomiting period. This stops you vomiting, which is really handy. So I use um, 50 mg cyclozine once every now and again if I really need it. Now, in terms of sort of other stuff I get through, I get through a fair bit of these sorts of things, freezing sprays, because if you have a muscle spasm sometimes, the freeze and stretch approach works. I get through these. These are acupuncture needles. Um, I push these through muscle spasms, dry needling of trigger points. A uh, really effective technique. It's not acupuncture, but it uses acupuncture needles. I do that myself, or my physiotherapist does it for me. Uh, he taught it to me really, I suppose, but I find if sometimes I just have to do it myself. Supplementation. I use vitamin D. A lot of people with EDS are not deficient, but insufficient with vitamin D, and that has problems with all sorts of aspects of our metabolism. So I take 25 micrograms a day, um, all year round, particularly important in the winter. I also use... This stuff, Occuvite, which is a lutein preparation. The reason I use this is actually an empty jar. Um, they're nice little yellow capsules. Lutein is um, supposedly able to help with uh, macular degeneration. And I have dry macular degeneration in my left eye. So um, giving this a go at 6 milligrams once a day. It's also got some vitamin C and some vitamin E and some copper and some zinc in it. God knows what they do, but it was the cheapest way I could get hold of lutein at the right dose um, when I was in the pharmacy uh, last time I bought it. Because I just buy the very cheapest form of lutein that I can. I mean, I really, there is no point buying all these weird expensive preparations, but this was on offer. Uh, if you have macular degeneration, maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't, who knows. But as I'm slowly going blind in that eye, it really is the only option that I've got. I'm going to keep using it. I get through a fair amount of these things, urine test strips. Um, we all get interstitial cystitis, which is kind of like cystitis without the infection. These things are pretty useful for telling us what's going on in the bladder, uh, what's going on with the kidneys, 
can be useful things to have so that you can avoid an unnecessary trip to the doctor. Now, I wouldn't say that everyone should go down the route of using these things. I have got relevant skills in biochemistry and so on from um, my career, I guess. I would classify myself as an expert patient. I know medics hate that phrase. So I'm confident and comfortable that I'm not going to kind of overdiagnose or misdiagnose myself with them. All I'm trying to find out is, is this pain infection or is it inflammation? And then I can act accordingly. It's as simple as that. So that's um, really what I get through, um, I guess, uh, over the course of a month.